Let's reconsider the furniture production problem that we have studied in previous videos. As before, we are interested in making tables and chairs. The price for a table is 16 euros and the price for a chair is 10 euros. 2x4s and 2x2s are needed to build the furniture and the production coefficients are known. In contrast to what we had in previous videos, let's assume now that the 2x4s and the 2x2s are not on stock, but they must be bought from suppliers. Two suppliers exist. Both of them make 2x4s. But upon request, a 2x4 can be cut into two so that a pair of 2x2s can be made available. So if we need 6 2x4s, we must order 6. And if we need 8 2x2s, we must order 4 2x4s and request that these be cut into 2x2s. The price for a 2x4 depends on the supplier. If we buy a pair of 2x2s, that is, request that a 2x4 is cut into 2, a little extra is charged so that the price for a pair of 2x2s is different from the price of a 2x4. The number of 2x4s that can be bought from a supplier is limited due to limited production capacities on the supplier's side. The limits are 3 and 7 respectively. Now our problem is to determine the number of tables and chairs to build and to decide from which supplier we are going to buy how many 2x4s or pairs of 2x2s respectively. Our objective is to maximize the profit contribution where the profit contribution in our context is defined to be the revenue minus the cost for material. Now test yourself and try to model this problem. Pause the video now. One possible model formulation uses x1 and x2 for the number of tables and chairs respectively. In addition, we have decision variables z11 for the number of 2x4s bought from supplier 1, z12 for the number of pairs of 2x2s bought from supplier 1, z21 and z22 are defined likewise for the second supplier. This allows us to formulate the following. Maximize revenue minus cost of material. Make sure that the number of small parts used does not exceed the number of small parts ordered. Make sure that 6 2x4s and 4 pairs of 2x2s are bought. And finally, make sure that we do not order more from a supplier than he can deliver. Do not forget the domains of the decision variables.
This is a correct model formulation for the problem at hand. But if you look closely, there is something special with this model. There are constraints that solely depend on the x variables and there are constraints that depend on the z variables only. These two sets of constraints do not share common decision variables. In other words, these two sets of constraints are independent. At the same time, the objective function can be split into two parts, the revenue part and the cost of material part. The former depends on the x variables only and the latter depends only on the z variables. As a consequence, we can split the whole model into two parts. Part 1 maximizes the revenue and part 2 minimizes the cost of material. Note that the objective function of the second part can be multiplied by minus 1 to transform the maximization problem into an equivalent minimization problem as shown in a previous video on model transformations. This makes it more obvious that the second part actually minimizes the cost of material. And by the way, the second part is a transportation problem that was discussed in a previous video. As a result, we have that our problem can be modeled in two ways. We can formulate one big model, so to say, that includes all the aspects that are relevant in one common model. Or, as an alternative, we can formulate two smaller models that cover the two independent aspects of the problem without omitting anything. Both approaches are correct. But what is better? With regard to modeling, both approaches are equally good. But when it comes to solving a model, solving one big model requires more runtime than solving two or sometimes more independent and small models which, when combined, lead to the big model. Therefore you should, whenever possible, present separate model formulations for independent parts of a problem. A typical situation in which not always, but very often, such independent parts occur is when you apply Lagrangian relaxation, a technique that was described in a previous video. So when you apply Lagrangian relaxation, you should always carefully check if the relaxed model can be split into two or more independent parts. Note that Lagrangian relaxation is not the only context in which you may encounter independent parts. Sometimes, like in our example, the problem itself consists of several independent subproblems. Now that we understand this, let's modify our problem slightly. We have assumed that we know that we want to order 6 2x4s and 4 pairs of 2x2s from the suppliers. Suppose that we do not know this in advance. New decision variables y1 and y2 can then be introduced to denote the number of 2x4s and the number of 2x2 pairs we are going to buy. What would change then? Try to modify the model formulation from above and I'm talking of the big model here. So try this and pause the video now. The following modifications need to be done. Given this, think about what you just learned. Do we still have independent subproblems here? The answer is no. The part that depends on the x variables contains y variables, and the part that depends on the z variables contains y variables too. Due to the y variables, the two parts interact and are not independent anymore. Consequently, we cannot split this modified model into two smaller models.